make 2020 fantastic. Come to Aircon, 13th to the 15th of March, and you can meet some fantastic people, play some fantastic games. Just everything is going to be fantastic. You can get your tickets now by going to aircon.co.uk forward slash tickets or by following the links in the show notes. And now, on with the show. Welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for 2020. 2020. It's like 2020 vision. It's like looking at things in a new way, or maybe not only just looking at things in a new way, but maybe expanding your horizons, expanding where you're looking. So maybe we're not just looking at kind of tabletop on the table, but maybe we're also looking at digital tabletop as well. Maybe we're considering maybe traveling to far off exciting lands and places. And you've got to begin your year with something fun, something exciting, something different, and something which, you know, maybe... Even their name itself kind of gives a little bit of a background about where they are. Um, so joining me, um, they, they, they need no introduction, even though that has been an introduction. I've got Suzanne Sheldon, who's known for the Dice Tower. She's known for many things. She's known for apps and stuff, but she has now been known for saying yes and guesting on this show. So hello, Suzanne. Hello, Richard. I, I believe I said yes quite a while ago. And have been looking forward to this opportunity for a very long time. <laughs> a very long time. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I have no excuse. I, I generally, I have a list and um, I keep kind of having to organize and reorganizing my time. And then I thought, and then I, I realized your name was on the list and I went, I really need to, to kind of make that effort and just jump on and just jump in there and just say, come on, let's get this organized. And thankfully, you didn't spurn me and send me away with a tail between my legs like a spurned dog. Um, but you said yes to come on. So thank you very, thank you very much. Um, first of all, are you well? I guess is the first question. Oh, Richard, is anybody ever truly well in today's world? <laughs> Yes, I'm quite well. Yes. I'm quite busy. To be honest with you, I'm barely know, I can barely look ahead more than a week in my life right now. But I always say better busy than bored. And I'm quite busy. So there you have it. What's kind of taking up your time? I mean, are you are you are you in? Are you at the point where you're having to bring out? Are you using things like Google Keep to keep a track of all your tasks and stuff like that? Are you using spreadsheets? I mean, are you constantly having to go, oh, I need to do this, 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 and this? Oh, I have spreadsheets. I have <laughs> multiple project management and task list tools. I've got Google Docs. I've got Asana. I've got Trello. I've got <laughs> I've got lists to keep track of my lists, and I'm still barely keeping up. So uh, I don't know sometimes if technology helps or hurts me in my personal life management, but uh -huh. I keep on trying, and sometimes that's the best we can do. It's a new year, so um, one of the things that everybody will be looking forward to is kind of conventions and plans. We want to talk about Aircon because we're going to jump back and forward anyway. But I, I've got a list in my head, and if I don't say something, I'll forget, and it'll just drift off, and then we'll get to the end of the show, and you'll be like, you didn't ask us about Aircon. Um, you are venturing over to... Um, to what the Americans would call England and what us up in Scotland would call the UK, because England's a different country. But um, are you still venturing over to see us in March to coming to Harrogate and spending some time at Aircon? I am indeed, and I I am so excited. I am not excited for the flight, but I am hmm. excited for actually being at the convention. 
Because how long is the flight going to be? Is like an eight? Is it an eight hour flight or is it? Oh like no, a it's it's like twelve hours. Wow. And actually, because of the airport situation, I have to take three flights, and it stretches oh. out to like sixteen hours or eighteen hours, something like that. That's dedication. I'm very, very excited for Aircon. What can I say? <laughs> Did you have Have you been to? Because I know um, you went to Essen, and I know you're kind of like a regular. And I'm guessing you're a regular at like kind of like the bigger conventions in the US. So have you been to kind of like UK Games Expo before yourself? No, or? I haven't. Right. I haven't been to any gaming event in the UK at all, or or in that general vicinity i've been only to essen yeah i i am truly thrilled to go to aircon and i i have you been to aircon yeah i went last year for the first time so good you can tell me a little bit about what to I expect can tell because you, I, I, I don't can, know i can answer any questions that you have in fact i was speaking to mark cook today and i said you know suzanne's coming on the show to have a chat and he said to me you make sure you answer any questions that Suzanne has and don't don't make a whole load of fibs and lies up so that <laughs> you, <laughs> so that you worry you worry her. And I was like, I'll see what I can do. So I am here. I was I have no I have no um kind of bias on this at all uh, in any way shape or form whatsoever maybe maybe not but um what are your questions as somebody who's going to be landing in aircon for the first time what what kind of questions do you have that i can maybe answer for you so i don't typically eat meat okay what are my food options looking like um there is the in terms of food options there are food vans within the vicinity in fact one of the things that I loved, I have um, I have celiacs, so I have a wheat intolerance. So me being able to get food myself was a very, very, um, is a very, very sensitive issue because if I'm not able to get something to eat, then it's just, you know, I get hungry and then I get grumpy. But um, they do have vans there. They, do, they were having kind of like pizza. So you could have different pizza. There were people doing pancakes there. Um, there were people that would be doing, um, yeah, salads and stuff like that so you'll be easy and then Harrogate itself um, the convention centre is within pretty much the town centre so it's very very easy for you to get out and about to kind of local restaurants you can walk pretty much any you know not too far within Harrogate and you'll find yourself there's a lot of pubs around the area there's a lot of restaurants around the area so you shouldn't find it too too difficult to be um, catered for and even a lot of the big chains, you know, there's a big push for, you know, there's even a big push for like veganism and vegetarianism and everything like that. So you'll be catered for quite well, I would have thought. And okay. I can bring you, I can bring you some lettuce. Okay. If you, if you want. That sounds delightful. I like how you, the first food places that you mentioned were all things that you couldn't eat at, like pizza and pancakes. Yes. yes. Well, the, the pizza van and the pancake van both offered a gluten free version. So I was spoiled because that was one of my ma main concerns is when I'm here, I'm going to be able to get something to eat. And then I went outside and I asked and they says, yeah, we can do you a gluten free pizza. And there was a pancake van. They said, yeah, we can do you a gluten free pancake. So I was, you know, I was happy, content, stuffed, you could even say. Uh, that sounds delightful and, and better stuffed than hungry and angry. So <laughs> that's delightful. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, um, have you got a ticket? Have you organised kind of like places to stay as well? Then I believe, I believe I have a hotel room and I, that I'm cool. staying with Mandy, who is my podcasting partner on the yes. Dice Tower, yes. and uh, my partner on our some new YouTube videos uh, shows as well. Okay, I have no idea where that is. <laughs> I, I'm just going to show up and <laughs> hopefully up. Mark will, I'll say, hopefully Mark will recognize us and then say, here's where you are sleeping. I, um, yeah, I think Mark, um, Mark had, um, had Rodney over a couple of times and I know mm -hmm. that, um, he, you know, he made sure that, you know, he'll look after you, you'll go out, he'll take you out. He says that he will, um, he's, he's promised that he will personally make sure he cooks for you a couple of times, um, 
so he's not just living up to his name. Um, so there's that. I, I can't remember what else he's promised, um, but I'm sure we could add we could add a couple of things, add a couple of things to the to the list. Um, you are aware that Aircon is, in terms of the convention, it's a much. It's not huge, huge, and it's very, very f- kind of focused on the the kind of the game side of things. There's quite a few kind of dis- there's quite a few. Um, there are going to be quite a few kind of exhibitors attending, kind of just you know showing off and demoing their games. Is there anything that you are you looking forward to? What are you looking forward to, kind of the most, kind of when you're there? Is it playing games or is it meeting kind of certain people, other kind of media people? What are you what are you what are you looking for? I'll tell you, it's it's a position of privilege, and I'm very aware of it that I get to go to a fair number of conventions, and I've mm-hmm. been to dozen of dozens of conventions over the last uh, decade. But mm-hmm. I have found sure I love going to Essen because there are literally hundreds of games there that I want to purchase yeah. and play, and I find that thrilling, and I love doing that. But if I had my druthers, if magically all the hot new games that interest me would just show up on my doorstep, I would be perfectly happy not attending large conventions. I love conventions most that let me sit down and play games and make new friends or play with old friends that we only get to see each other at conventions. So mm-hmm. what I'm really hoping at Aircon is that – People will say hi and yeah. will want to play games with me. I almost never ask to join a game. I love being asked to join games, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Do you feel because you're kind of your well known kind of name and face within the kind of the media space, do you find that people don't approach you as regularly? I mean, normally when I meet people, I have to walk up to them and say, see the t-shirt? I do a podcast. And it's like, don't worry, everybody does a podcast. But do you, do you would you kind of wish sometimes for a little bit of the an, the an, the anonymous days where you could pretty much wander around a convention and you wouldn't have people kind of sidling up kind of awkwardly to you just to say hello, where you could just sit down with people and say, oh, can I can I join in and have a game kind of thing? I I think it's interesting that you ask the question in that way because – I, I'm not that well known in, in, at least when I go to conventions, I certainly have some people who come up to me and introduce Mm -hmm. themselves and are familiar with something that I've done in video or via the podcast. And that's absolutely delightful and thrilling, quite frankly, but it doesn't happen that often. I think there are far more game players, game buyers, gamers out there that have no clue and give no cares about who I am or what I do in the industry than gamers out there who know who I am and who do care about what I'm doing. And so going to conventions, I don't necessarily have a wish for anonymity because I don't think that I'm as, I don't, it doesn't impact me when people do recognize me because it's a pleasant moment and we, we move on. So from that perspective, I guess I don't wish for more anonymity because I have plenty already. (laughs) And I think for you, it's totally true. Uh, One of the advantages I have is I do video and so your face is out there. It's one of the weirdest things about the board gaming industry is the the facelessness of so many people involved. So for people who do podcasts, everybody knows your voice. If they hear you speak, they might go, oh – yeah, I, I know you. You do you do that podcast with yeah. that Scottish dude? Yeah. Um, but they might not know you across the room if they saw you across the room. And what's funny is it's the same for game designers. I have been at many large conventions, and I happen to know a fair number of game designers now. So if I'm standing next to a game designer and talking to them, uh, just at PAX Unplugged. Uh, a lovely person came up and asked to take a photo with me because they were a fan of the podcast. And that's, yeah, yeah. you know, delightful. But the person I was with oh, is Isaac Vega, 
who if, uh, from Plaid Hat Games who designed yeah. Ashes, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. they had, and so he looks at Isaac Vega and, and hands him his phone and says, will you take a photo of us? And Isaac just smiles and says, of course. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, this is so weird. Um, it's It's an odd thing, I think, in our industry or in our hobby overall that people like you can flit around uh, fairly unknown in public spaces, even in public spaces surrounded by people who know who you are, technically. Yeah, I did kind of, when I was at Aircon last year, I did get, when I was in the elevator and I just asked somebody if they would they were having a good time, they were like, yeah, it's brilliant. And then they went, um, I know your voice. And I was like, ah, okay. And that was the one time, the only time in the entire of Air- Aircon, and I kind of walked out and I went, yes. And then obviously, it was like you said, I was able to kind of go around and I kind of was able to meet people that I wanted to meet, a lot of the exhibitor guys and, you know, say it was strange being able to say hello to people that I had been speaking to an awful lot online. And it mm-hmm. was also that kind of um, awkwardness, unawkwardness of meeting with people that I'd had guesting on the show mm-hmm. for the first time because there wasn't <laughs> that kind of, when you meet somebody for the first time, there's the kind of like, oh, yeah, hi, how are you? Kind of thing. It was straight into kind of like, you know, maybe having conversations with this person for an hour on and off and then through Twitter DMs for ages. So it was almost a case of, you know, you know, how are you doing? You know, you muppet kind of thing. And it was straight into kind of like chat and kind of conversation and stuff like that, which kind of happened to me. It happened to me recently when I met um, I met Mike Delisio, um yes. quite recently for the first time, um, kind of the, the tail end of last year. So there wasn't that kind of, it was just straight into let's get a game then because we don't have to have this kind of awkward thing. So that was kind of, that was kind of, that was kind of cool. Um, are you looking for, are you going to be sitting down then and trying to get a few games in? I mean, normally at the conventions, do you get a chance to play a kind of a lot of games or are you kind of doing kind of some media stuff that you've got to cover as well? I, I hope, quite frankly, that almost all my time at Aircon okay. is spent either eating food or playing games. <laughs> it, it just that's – I would – I don't uh, – I have a couple of minor obligations, and I think uh-huh. that Mark has been uh, – Mandy and I are talking about some kind of group event that we could do, whether it's mm-hmm. a, a collective roll and write game session or something like that. Yeah. But really, I'm going to Aircon to hopefully meet people and hopefully get to play games. And honestly, I would say of all the conventions I go to in a given year, I only get to play games at maybe 50% of them. And wow. that's what I really, I love playing games. That's why I do what I do. That's why yeah, I've yeah, been yeah. Yeah. a board gamer for 25 plus years is I yeah. love games. So I'm really, that's the vibe. Mark is, Mark Cook, the organizer, such a wonderful, friendly, affable person. I think that he's trying to arrange it so that we get that time and that we add whatever value we can to the convention as people who make content, but also just get to enjoy it as as gamers, getting to play games with cool people in the UK. Yeah. I mean, that's what I did last year. As I said, I met, um, I met Ross, uh, more games please, Ross, who is the loveliest person um, and in the entire hobby. And has some of the loveliest hair. I didn't want to say that, but I have, you know, I have tried as he's walked past me to, to smell it to see if it smells as good as the way it looks. But um, you know, and so far, I know that's that's a taboo thing, and there's obviously there's a lot of consent issues that. But it wasn't like close enough to look like I was doing it. But I just kind of sidled up, kind of very slightly, and you know, um, and I didn't I didn't manage. So that's that's potentially what's happening. I, I he's going to be coming back on the show, so I may, should maybe should just. I should maybe just bite the bullet and ask him if I can maybe you know um you know tweak his tweak his shell like nose and and ruffle his that lovely curly mop of hair that he does have, um but that's all good yeah so no it'll be good to it'll be good to see kind of kind of people kind of people like that um are you gonna are you are you are you gonna gonna kind of be shipping in then shipping out then are you kind of gonna be arriving spend your time at aircon and then are you away or are you gonna are you are you got time to kind of like spend a couple of days kind of seeing the sites as well that is a regret i have is i am shipping in and shipping out uh i have young children and oh, yeah. they are dependent on me and the yeah. 
the time away is is pretty rough. I would have loved, and we talked a little bit. Mandy and I talked about trying to pad the end of our trip so that we could visit other areas. But unfortunately, I don't think for me that's going to work out. So I'm flying in and spending a few days and then taking another, you know, 16-hour flight back. Wow. And it'll be totally worth it. Is it is it tough being away from the kids, though? It's very difficult. I'm uh, My kids drive me bonkers. They're yeah. 7 and 11. But wow. I'm, I'm pretty fond of them overall. And... Uh, <laughs> I, I do prefer... You've not cloned them then. But let's be clear. I don't like them so much that I want to bring them with me to Aircon. I, I was going to say that. I was going to say, you've not taken the extra step. No, no. You, they you're kind of like saying, you know, honey, I'm going to miss you both and I love you both so, so much. But now I'm going to get on a plane. <laughs> That's exactly it. Bye. What, are you doing something important, Mum? Um... Yes, I am. It might involve, but don't worry about the photographs that you see. You might see me sitting playing lots of board games, but I'm doing really, really serious work. Kind of thing. And that's the beautiful thing is that because I do board games for work, yeah. they buy that. They they believe it. They go, oh, that's work. <laughs> so so I've you, got could them just, you could just get away with it. That's fantastic. You could just get away with it. Totally. That's Truth just like with that. your children is so overrated. I, I was like... <laughs> I've seen kind of things like this all the time, like talking about, you know, them going about um, um, politicians lying and stuff like that. And it's like, well, I don't know, because like from a very, very early age, you're kind of pretty much lying to your kids constantly about how things <laughs> kind of work. So they kind of get a grasp of the understanding. You know, there is the whole kind of the big, the big, uh, the big Christmas one as well. <laughs> Kind of that, indeed, and, and how very diplomatic of you to, to phrase it that way. That is yes. that is one that is perpetuated in my house, and yes. one of my two children uh, still believe it. So yes, and that's, that's fun. That kind of makes it fun because then it's almost like there's a there's an extra conspiracist. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> that's what it is, and I think that that's what's extended it for my youngest yes. so much is the older kiddo yes. plays into it as well. So yeah. And they usually come back and they've got absolutely amazing, extra, fantastical ideas that you would have never thought of. And you're just like that. I'm glad you know, but I'm going to be sad when the other one doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much. Thing. Exactly. Exactly. Um, with you being kind of involved in board games so much, um, is that a big time? Is that is that a big part of what you're doing with the kids as well? Or... Do you kind of say, well, okay, I'm, I'm kind of doing so many board games here. We have to do kind of other things. And the time that you have maybe with the kids in terms of board games, it's like a moderated, it's a moderated kind of thing so that they're not constantly sitting around at a table learning life skills and learning how to communicate that you do. <laughs> get on get on Netflix, right? Uh, New yeah, series of Pokemon's on. Get yourself on Netflix. Well, it, it's funny you say that because my daughter, my 11-year-old, she will... Mm. She will sit and watch Disney tween shows all day long if I let her. Um, so there's that. But no, both of my children really do enjoy board games, but mm -hmm. not nearly to the degree that I enjoy board games at. Yeah. And I want board games to be a positive thing to them. I want it to be something that they look forward to. And I want it yeah. to be something that we can enjoy as a family for decades to come. So I don't push it. When they ask to play a board game, we'll play. Once in a while, I'll suggest, hey, I got this game that's perfect for us. Why don't we try it? Mm. Um, sometimes they'll say, I don't feel like it right now. Sometimes they'll say, great, let's do it. And uh, we we play, I would say my kids and I play games probably three times a week together about, which I think is delightful and wonderful. And uh, I'd like to keep it that way where it's a positive thing for them overall. Do you have, um, do you have like favorites that you go back to? Because one thing I'm aware of is, and and this is probably you and me in the same boat is, um, <clears throat> well, me more and more now is I'm I get sent kind of games that I'm either writing about or you know going to be speaking to people about, and so my friends kind of don't like me turning up at games night because I've always got some <laughs> I've always got some game that's got kind of dice dice faces with bits of paper stuck on them or I've got a new game that everybody's kind of got to learn um, 
and I don't, you know, sometimes they just say, "Let's can we just play a game that we've played before?" So do you? Are you in the situation? Do you get? Do you get the lovely situation where you get to play the new and exciting game sometimes with the kids, but you're also sometimes they're just like, "Look, can we not just play Donuts for Donuts or, you know, something like that? Just something that we know rather than having to learn a new game all the time." Absolutely, a hundred percent. My. Mm. Uh, kids will actually rarely ask to play a new game. They love right. playing games that they know. They they yeah. love not having to go through the rules process. Yeah. They're children. They get impatient. Learning rules, even on simpler games, can be tough. So mm-hmm. favorites in my house are the game. Yes. And Outfoxed, which is a little cooperative deduction game. Okay. Konga from Haba you, uh, is a really popular one with them right now. And we're playing a lot of Slide Quest right now. So they definitely, don't get me wrong, they like new games and they'll learn them, but they will they won't look at a stack of games that I have on my shelf and go, ooh, what's that? Can we try it? They yeah. will always ask for a game they know first. Yeah, yeah. It's the same here. It's like um, Super Rhino Hero Battle, but I can never get the name right. It's always the wrong way around, but I know, you know, everybody knows what I mean. But that always comes out. King Domino is another one that always comes out. Um because those are games that we know. I tried, I got, um, I played King, King Domino Duel, mm-hmm. the roll and write one. The roll and write, yep. Um, and they were kind of hesitant in playing it because they weren't sure. But once they played it, they absolutely loved it. And it's now moved one that they would, you know, play again and again. And they kind of, they kind of, they kind of like really like it. Um, did you play, when you were growing up yourself, did you play a lot of games as a child? I mean, was your, was your family unit a family unit and did you kind of all get together, sit around a table and get to board games? You said 25 years. So um, was it something that was first instilled with you as a child or was the board game side of things, was that brought in kind of later on and introduced into your life later on? Well, the way I, I tell it is I discovered modern gaming in 1994 with mm-hmm. Magic the Gathering. Right. And then in between, as you're waiting for... A, a fresh opponent to come up at, at the back of this dingy, dusty game store in yeah. Washington State. Um, they also had some board games. And so we started playing board games in between mm-hmm. matches of magic. And, and that's how I discovered board games and just modern gaming in general. But for sure, the love of gaming was seeded with me from a very young age through classic card games. So I grew up playing Bridge and Euchre. Wow. And hearts with my grandparents primarily. And so from a very young age, classic card games kind of made sure that I was destined to play other games for the rest of my <laughs> life, I guess. Bridge isn't the easiest game for a child to play. I mean, I never said I did it well. <laughs> I just had very patient grandparents. You'd have to. I can't imagine. I can't imagine that. It's just I, I remember um, I remember we playing Snap Um my father, who was a funny man, said, would you like to play 52-card pickup? Um, to which he'd go, he'd put the cards all over the floor, and then, there you go, son, as he went off and, you know, did something else. Um, but, yeah, Bridge, um, how old were you then? What, <laughs> nine, ten? Yeah, exactly right. Wow. Right in that age. Wow. And they would have, they had this, when I would go and stay with them and visit them, they had this little group of retired military people that would uh-huh. get together and they would have coffee and tea and sit down. And they, there was like a group of, they would have three or four tables going at a time and I would get to sit down with them. And, oh, cool. And, and it was, it was, it was lovely. And to this day, I still adore trick taking games. So anytime a modern game comes out, like Time yeah. Chase came out recently, and I just yeah. love this game. And part of my love for it is definitely seated in the fact that I it's it's a trick taking game. Do you do you play any of these kind of classic? You talked about Snap, but you know, Spades or Hearts or Pinochle, yeah. anything like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, um, all the time. I, mean, I, t- I try it because sometimes it's like playing. It's like, especially my son is trying to show them kind of what I used to play as a youngster and even just showing them how to play patience you know because mm-hmm. nowadays they're just like their eyes are all over the place and they just can't yeah. concentrate it's like no you've got to work as the strategy and then you get them to sit down i mean tonight um i was playing four in a row with my son now he's seven so he's the same age as your youngest one and he's got to the stage now where um it's kind of gone from that point where i was letting him win to the point now where i'm trying not to lose 
because Absolutely. he just he's just like banging these counters in kind of left, right, and center. And I'm just like going, um, I really want to play a different. Let's <laughs> <it's> like, come <laughs> on, well, um, come on. Like, have you ever played scythe? <laughs> just get that. There you go. Here, like, let's play a let's play a proper a proper slightly uh, bigger. No, but I find that he's at that age where he is. His um his hand his hand eye coordination is getting obviously an awful lot better, but his critical thinking and everything like that, he's really kind of coming on. So when we were playing like King Domino, before it was just like lucky if he laid the right tile down to play it. Now he's actively knows which ones he wants to go for in order to score the best points. And it's the same with, you know, um Brighton Hero Super Battle or Go Nuts for Donuts. He knows exactly what he's meant to be going for. He's not just grabbing. He's at the beginning, he was obviously in Gonuts for Donuts. He's grabbing cards and going, I won a card. Wasn't I lucky? He's now saying, right, I definitely want to get this card. But recently when we played a game, he went after a card that I needed mm. to stop me from getting it. And then I just looked at him and went, I can't teach you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. You know, the, the pupil has become the master and all that Star Wars. And did you feel proud or were you a little, did you have just a little twinge of my time has passed? I kind of, you know, I was kind of thinking, you know, now we've got, we can move on maybe to some of the slightly um, different games. You know, maybe what's the next level up? What are the other things that we could get them, you know, you could maybe get them involved in kind of thing. Because obviously I've got, I've got a cupboard full of games. So, you know, him moving up a level, you know, starting to be, you know, unconsciously competent in a game and, and knowing how to strategize and stuff like that. I'm just thinking, yes, I cannot wait until we're going to break in it. Right, Sam, we're going to do through the ages. It's going to take seven and a half hours and you're going to cry a bit. We're going to work our way through it, whatever kind of whatever <laughs> happens kind of thing. Um, in terms of the um, the kind of the, the content that you do, um, do you... Do you, do you keep, kind of keep an eye on, on the kind of the, the kids' games? Or, I mean, when you're looking for a game, do you keep the kind of the family side kind of in consideration? Or do you just say, well, I just... Because games can be so accessible. I mean, I know there's some really, really complicated games. I mean, I played... I played, I played The first game I played with my eldest two was Pandemic. Hmm. When they were about kind of... They must have been about nine and seven years old at the time. And they were able to grasp of a very, very complicated game that I obviously quarterbacked quite a bit to help them through. But when you're looking at games, do you do you kind of keep the family thing in mind? Or are you just saying, well, let's any game that comes in could be potentially something that everybody could enjoy? No, I I have friends and I know people from online mm -hmm. that have eight year olds, nine year olds that play Caverna and play Puerto Rico and yeah. quite advanced heavy games with them. And I think that's wonderful. I can tell you for my children, that's not a good fit for them at where they are in um, their gameplay enjoyment level, let alone their cognitive ability level. Yeah. And so I do. I When I think about specifically right now my podcast, but also this new video review show that Mandy and I are starting up soon, hmm. my – kind of driving thoughts. I have a few of them. I love highlighting family games. I think that a, a fair number of us have kids. and yeah. I, But I think that there's not everyone is talking about kid games. And certainly while my children are young enough that they can play those games and still enjoy them, I mean, at some point, they'll age out of them yeah. from an enjoyment point of view. And, and perhaps it won't be as big of a priority to me at that point. So family games are games that appeal to younger gamers or perhaps people who aren't as familiar with the hobby and are looking for a simpler, lighter entry into the hobby. I like to look at games from that perspective, even though those aren't necessarily the games I love to play myself. Is that why you kind of went into the app stuff as well? Because generally, a lot of the complicated sides of playing a board game can be usually are usually handled extremely well by an app. I'm thinking, you know, I know I joked through the ages, but I've heard a lot of people who, once they play like the app version of Through the Ages, will never actually touch their physical copy of the board game because it takes away a lot of the kind of the number crunching and the, 
the nonsense that kind of happens with it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the benefits of apps, but that's mm. not a driving reason of why I got into them mm. or why I decided to start talking about them. Um, when I had my first kiddo, yeah, I life changes dramatically and I realized that I just had no ability to play games in yeah. the way I used to. I had other priorities. I was tired. I didn't want to you know, do things like put on pants so I could go <laughs> game with people. Like, <laughs> And that was right around the time that things like the smartphone were coming out yeah. and games were starting to be released on them. And I realized, oh, I can get some of this experience and kind of soothe some of my desire to play these kinds of games yeah. all in digital form. And so that's why I started playing them. And then... I started talking about them because when I realized that I felt like I wanted to make content or start doing reviews or whatever you want to call them, I wanted to join the community in a way that added value and wasn't necessarily doing something that was doing something that wasn't already being done by a lot of other people. And I realized that at that time, really, there weren't too many people covering board game apps. There were a lot of people covering app gaming, but yes. they almost completely ignored the board game ports. And then on the board game side, they were definitely pretty much completely ignoring the app side of that hobby. And I thought that that was a nice little gap that I could help try to fill with um, discussion and video about board game apps. So that's really why I started doing board game app videos uh, five or six years ago. Because it's a very, um, there's still a very kind of Luddite view. I know that every time I see a new piece of kind of technology um, kind of coming out that isn't, it, that it does any kind of amalgamation between kind of electronic oh, yes. and board game. There's always, I mean, I've seen it with um, um, Teberu, Simon's mm -hmm. kind of thing, which yep. people are going, this could be cool. And there's a lot of people going, keep your electronics away from my cardboard or I'll slap you mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, and I always see this people kind of holding back to say, well, I I don't like the idea of having kind of mobile mobile phones or any kind of technology near, near the cardboard at all because that brings people who will just sit on the mobile phones and I kind of don't kind of don't want that which is always kind of interesting but yeah I see what you're saying with the the board game app side of things is that I am I have a lot of board games that I play I have very few apps that I play um because and this is straight this is strange the reason for this is um unlike a lot of the board game <laughs> unlike a lot of mobile apps board game apps generally cost money mm -hmm. um, because they don't run on a kind of a free to play kind of um a free to play kind of model mm -hmm. so have you have you seen that is that generally because i've seen some hefty prices well not hefty it's not hefty compared to a board game obviously you not paying a hundred dollars for a mobile app but um I, I remember buying kind of like shards of infinity and it was mm -hmm. about eight it was probably about ten dollars mm -hmm. which is a pretty big chunk of change for a mobile game when you're getting things like um when you're getting things like um clash and clash of clans and stuff like that you're not paying anything at all for them which is kind of weird um right because that's because Clash of Clans relies on alternate revenue sources, including yes. in-app purchases and advertising. And yes. board games don't often have that, almost never have that structure. Some board games have expansions that they could add as IAP for sure, but it's fairly uncommon for you to see a board game app having one of the uh, board the video game pricing structures and revenue structures. So instead, board games tend to follow the premium model where you definitely pay more up front, but that's really the only way that they can get that revenue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then the other side of it, we've also, you're starting to see kind of um, games coming out through the Steam platform, um, right. like Gloomhaven and things like that as well, which is like, it's almost like um, your adaptations um, kind of going. I mean, are you... I mean, I've seen you've talk about them. I mean, are you are you kind of like a fully converted kind of? I'm quite happy to 
kind of kind of straddle the electronic and the kind of the cardboard completely now. Yeah, absolutely. I have no problem with board game apps or digital versions of mm -hmm. board games. I don't typically have a lot of problems with technology that integrates with a, a otherwise analog game like Mansions of Madness or XCOM or things like that. Yeah. I understand why some people do. And the reality is, from my perspective, a lot of those cases tend to distill down to personal behavior and control in some ways. If you want to escape the digital and you don't want it in your board game, that's fine. That's your choice. Yeah. But a lot of the complaints I hear are things like people are going to be on their phones and I want to just remove them, ban them from my table so that we can focus. And conversely, I would suggest that that's more about the social construct that you set up for your personal group and how people adhere to that. And there's a different conversation that needs to ha happen instead of just digital is bad and shouldn't touch my analog and, and certainly that. Reese's peanut butter cup argument. Um, <laughs> what was that? A Reese's peanut butter? I see. I don't know what that is. You, you should you, know. I don't know that what it is because well, although I, I do, you, know, I kind of know what it is now because you know. Obviously, I was speaking. Of, I was speaking about it when I was talking with Orange Nebula, but um, I never heard of a Reese's peanut butter pup. cup. Cup. I. Oh, a cup. All right. Well, I was wondering if it's like a dog that walks about like mixture of chocolate and peanut butter and i'm like going do they have shapes do they no, have that would names? be that that species would be extinct because i would have hunted <laughs> them all down and eaten them oh, just imagine this would be a completely quiet podcast because it's like i'm sorry suzanne's not able to come to the phone just now she's out hunting <laughs> again with you going out with a huge butterfly net and kind of like still stains of chocolate from your last kind of <laughs> conquest. Kind of just peanut butter trails streaming behind me. <laughs> just yeah. Like just making sure you're running everywhere so you can kind of, you know, keep the calories at bay. Because <laughs> well. those pups can move fast. Kind of <laughs> They're so slippery. <laughs> but they are so damn tasty at the same time. Oh. Um, you know, there's... And everybody's right. The fear does make them taste nicer. Um, <laughs> it seasons the peanut butter meat. <laughs> seasons, of seasons. Yeah, seasons, no. is, seasons is sweet. As and I know that a lot of people have a no phones at the table or there's a lot of online discussion about frowning upon phones being used at the table. And I take a different approach. I'm a mother. If I'm away from my children, I need to have my phone with me. I need to be able to be contacted if there's a problem or an emergency. Yeah. Um, and I do what I do. So I take photos. My phone is out. What I can tell you right now, my phone is out constantly while I play games. I take photos of games. I share them while I'm playing online to let people know what I'm playing and to kind of spread the good word of board games as best I can. I try to keep it very conversational. It's just, it's how I work. I like to talk about it while I'm doing it. Yeah. But I fully respect the player's experience so i'm also not one where people are elbowing me hey it's your turn and then i take 10 minutes to think about my turn i i am respectful of and aware of the table situation and and don't hold it up and don't let that interfere and i think that that's again just about personal responsibility and respect for the group and respect for the experience and the game itself yeah. as opposed to a problem with just an ex the existence of an object in a space uh, i'm i'm kind of I mean, as part and parcel of, you know, being who we are, um, myself, I do end up taking photographs of games when we're playing games, because sometimes the best part, you know, it's all very well. I I understand. I get the whole photography thing and people setting up and staging kind of things and making things look amazing, but also. Um, sometimes I'll take, like, just like you, I'll take pictures like of the middle of a game because I'll look back on those p pictures later on, months to come, and I'll say, "Oh yeah, that was the bit where I totally got got my ass kicked. That was that was a fun time." Um, <laughs> and you know, but also at the same time, it's not you know, there's there's difference between kind of setting up a couple of cards and and kind of looking like you're playing a game and actually seeing the game almost in its natural environment and kind of seeing it being kind of being played out. So I am. 
I, you know, if I kind of said, oh, I don't do that, then I'd be lying and people would be shouting and saying, he's lying because I do, uh, you know, I am putting up pictures on Instagram of what I've been playing on particular game nights, especially sometimes I'll take those actual live action pictures and put them in any kind of written, kind of written content that we would do. Um, would you, I mean, with, you mentioned the, the, the new video series that you're going to be doing with your partner in crime, Mandy. Yes. Um, why? What's made you decide to go and do something different? And do you want to can you tell us a little bit about what this is all about? Absolutely, of course. So one show we just launched at the beginning of the year, or actually at the end of 2019, was mm-hmm. Aptastic, which is our digital board game show where Mandy yeah. and I play digital board games either with or against each other depending on the situation and and live stream it they're thereby showcasing and proving our absolute embracing of the binary digital enemy i guess Mm -hmm. in in our hobby world but the other show that we are starting actually in just a couple of weeks from the day that we're recording here is a live streaming review show that we have called salt and sass and It's just Mandy and I, we're each going to talk about a couple of board games each episode. We'll share some photos. We'll give a very brief overview of what type of game it is and kind of how it plays. And then we'll give our opinions on it, of course. But what we really like to do is talk with other people and find out what other people think and what their experiences were, but also help people figure out if this is a game that they would like to invest in. Board gaming is very expensive. Board games are a luxury hobby, without a doubt, for the most part. And people look to people like you or people like me to help them understand where they should invest their dollars, whether it's because their tastes align or because certain details are shared that help them better understand what they're getting into, et cetera. And that's what Salt and Sass is really about because we're going to get to talk about the game and show off the game a little bit. But then because it's live streaming, we can take questions from the viewers and answer them in real time. And the benefit of that is one, somebody gets an answer right away, which is super cool. Instead of dropping a comment in a YouTube video and then waiting to see if the video maker ever responds. But also, they're thinking about the game in a different way than Mandy and I are. And so maybe their question will help other people watching get information that they would like to have about the game as well. So that's really what Salt and Sass is about. It's about showing off games and helping people find games that they might be interested in and just having fun and meeting people digitally and talking with them about games. And te- well, I've got two questions. The first question is, um, are you keeping score about who's winning the digital games? And currently, um, is it you that's winning between the two of you on the games that you've played? Absolutely. And it is <laughs> 50-50. We are batting 500 each right now. That is such a politician's answer i can't believe it um (laughs) secondly are you going to be selective with 50 i don't believe you for a second i'm sure um we'll see i'll be interested to see what happens in six months and if you if you'll be if you'll be ahead or or what will what will happen um in terms of the games for salt and sass are you are you picking them beforehand are they going to be games that you you have played um, cause I've seen, um, I know that Paul Grogan from Gaming Rules, he was playing around with saying, look, I'm just going to take a game out of the box oh, wow. and start playing it from the rules to see if I could actually kind of get it to the table and play the game, which I think would be an interesting thing. But are you, are you going to be playing games that you, you, you've already played with Mandy? Yeah, before. absolutely. On, on that front, it'll be much more of a traditional yeah. review show in that it's a game that we will have become reasonably familiar with and have an Uh opinion one way or another on and we'll be able to provide that insight i admire paul and i think that that caters i think paul's approach caters to paul's strengths in many many ways paul's strengths are not my strengths (laughs) and i would be terrified of doing something like that so uh yes we are we are following a more traditional line i'd probably forget to read halfway through i just 
was like, this isn't, I can't, nope, that word's gone. I can't, I don't even, how do you, what's this? It's M-E-E-P-L-E. How do you say that? Um, That's what would happen. Because I see Paul doing that and I'm just like, Paul, what are you doing? <laughs> it's like, you're going somewhere I can't follow kind of thing. It's very scary. But yeah, he's just that kind of dives in. But he's, he can, he's doing kind of live streaming on a, on a kind of a regular basis. Um. Is Salt and Sass going to be something that's going to be a weekly thing, a monthly thing, just whenever you can kind of do it kind of thing? Well, right now we're doing Aptastic every other Wednesday, and hmm. then Salt and Sass is scheduled to be every other Sunday. Okay. So we're trying to make it very consistent uh, just to help people discover it and rely on it, and it gives us something to plan and work around. Mm -hmm. And it allows us, by being consistent, it allows us to highlight more games. There are so many games coming out every month right now, it's impossible for anybody to keep up. But we're going to do our best to play the games that we have and get to share them as we go to help people discover them or, quite frankly, rule them out if they want to and to go from there. And have you got a plan of kind of like the next couple of games, games that you're doing or or what have you got kind of, kind of planned that you're going to be doing? So Salt and Sass starts January 19th oh. on Sunday. So it'll be our very, very first episode. So I am sure it will be fraught with issues being our inaugural episode, trying to do something different and fun. Yeah. But we do have our games planned. And we are planning ahead, typically, because what we want to be able to do is show images of the game. We're not going to just hold up components of the game because we feel like yeah. that doesn't best showcase it. So we'll... You know, just like we were talking about taking photos while you play, we're going to have this stockpile of photos and we have to preload them so that we can rotate through them as we're describing the game and explaining the game so that they mm -hmm. can show on screen. So we have we have planned ahead. And I, I do, in fact, know the two games I'm going to feature on the first episode. But you're not going to tell me. Are you just going to have to tune in and find out, aren't we? I'll tell you. I don't care. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I am going to cover a game called Rob Davio's Ship Shape. Okay. And a game called 18 Lilliput. Sounds familiar. I don't I, know why. But then it could be because I've got it confused with an 18xx game. But I'm guessing it's not an 18xx game, or am I wrong? <laughs> oh, well, Richard, you don't know what you've just asked. I, you have no idea I, what you've I, done. That's the qu I, you know, I've got my specially planned show notes if you refer to... Um, page 37, section C, you know this question was coming up. So, you know, I don't know why you're acting shocked unless you're very good at acting. But anyway, yes. yes. Tell me. 18, 18 Lilliput is a card-based 18xx game. Now uh, <coughs> I'm so glad I do my research before these things. <laughs> uh and for those who aren't aware, 18xx gamers are very passionate about their unique niche of games. Yes. And they are very, very opinionated. Yeah. And I I said 18 Lilliput was an 18xx game online publicly. Yeah. And proceeded to get... A fairly significant drubbing by strangers for hours because of that. Um, there, there apparently is some disagreement about whether 18 Lilliput <laughs> qualifies as an 18xx game or not. But I, after after much discussion and consultation with experts, I yes. have I have decided to stand by my stance that it is an 18xx game. And you've decided then, as also as well, to live stream it. Um. Livestream 18, Lilliput. And well, I understand I Understand you say you've got notes here to say you're going to be wearing t-shirts saying, be quiet, it is an 18xx game. Is that true as well? Or did I just make that up? No, no. I, I, thought, that I, was, I thought that was something I told you off the record. But <laughs> now that you've shared it, that's fine. It's started um, laundry time. <laughs> yeah. I, I will just point out the show is called Salt and Sass, not... Friendly, happy, cotton candy game time. So. <laughs> That'd be the anime version. <laughs> yeah. Take, take that for, for what you will. And exactly. I may have picked those games very specifically. We'll see how it goes. Wish me oh luck, please, Richard. I, you know, I. <laughs> God bless her and all who say, Lena. 
um, <laughs> as they would say, where's my bottle of champagne? Um, is it going to be on? It's is it going to be on a specific YouTube type channel? Is it going to be under your YouTube channel? Is it going to be where can you find it? I guess is the easiest question to ask. You got there eventually. You just had to go on a little I, journey. I did, like X Factor. <laughs> Uh, yes, it'll air on the Dice Tower's YouTube channel. Cool. The Dice Tower decided that they didn't really want to invest in building up their Twitch presence. So yeah. Mandy and I have a Twitch channel called Salt and Sass Games. And mm-hmm. so we will be broadcasting both on the Salt and Sass Twitch channel, but then we will be airing on the Dice Tower's YouTube channel. Do you think that's the way forward? Because I see that, um, I don't see it much in board game i don't know why i went high high pitch there um too much helium but do you think that um that's that the kind of the way it's, so much it probably does it probably does and also at the same time it probably doesn't um but i've seen it happening in a lot of role playing tt tabletop mm-hmm. rpg stuff mm-hmm. where people are going down the kind of the live stream kind of twitch kind of presentation i've not seen it so much yet on the board game tabletop side of things and I'm wondering if that's a direction where people are going to go. I think people, including Mandy and myself, are going to try. Mm-hmm. I think that it is a hard thing to do on Twitch. I think a good example of people who are doing it well are the Brothers Murph. Yes. Because those goofy boys are just amazing. They've got, they're hilarious and they're energetic and they just get it. And so I think that they have a real shot of being very successful on Twitch with uh, analog games. But the reality is, if you were to go to a board game convention and pick out any given random game, chances are you're looking at four people hunched over a table staring intensely at a board and not talking to each other half the time. It's um, it's just the nature of board games. They're cerebral. And certainly for Euro style games and things like that, they're not necessarily hugely animated. They don't necessarily come up with moments that have a lot of huge emotional bursts or things like that. No, so I think it's a yeah. hard a hard gaming medium to convey successfully in a platform like Twitch in general. So I I think I think a number I think people are going to try because Twitch is such a growing and huge entity in the world of gaming in general. Yes, but it is, yeah. it'll be interesting to see if people can really really make a go of it. Because I think there's distinct channels, ma- uh, challenges to that. Mandy and I are doing it because we want to see what happens uh, and just try to establish a presence. But we we already know from our first few episodes of Aptastic that without a doubt, at least from the YouTube point, from the Dice Tower's point of view, the YouTube channel is far more active and uh, engaged than Twitch is right now. We'll see. Yeah, and you and you don't um, you don't get anywhere if you just sit there doing nothing as well. And as I say, as you said, it's a growing platform, and it's just a case of how kind of how we how we kind of harness it. Um, have you not thought of jumping over the other side of the fence and kind of? I mean, is there the Suzanne Sheldon design book that's sitting there that you will you know Sunday night when the kids are in bed and you get half an hour to yourself that you've got this game designs and stuff like that you've scribbled together? Is that what Richard does? Um, no. I um I go ahead and that's when I usually spend my three or four hours researching my guests before I have them on to chat to them. <laughs> uh, I have always said that I admire and respect and appreciate game designers so much because I have no clue how or why their brains work the way they do. Yeah. They, it's an Absolutely. And if I was speaking more normally or casually here, I would be swearing right now. I <laughs> I have no freaking clue how game designers do what they do. And I think that that actually in some ways strengthens my appreciation for board games because there's always this element of mystery about them to me where – I go on a journey and I explore and discover and enjoy, and I have yeah. no idea how it how it happened. Um, it's I I can't garden. I'm I've got a black thumb, a huge massive <laughs> black thumb <laughs> that controls the weather too. I d- <laughs> I can't believe. Yeah, we are we are going there. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I I greatly appreciate people who can garden and greatly yeah. appreciate flowers and gardens and things like that. I just can't do it myself. So no, I have absolutely no desire to design a game on my own. I just like telling people why games are good or bad because apparently that's where I think I have authority, even though I can't do it myself. And isn't that just <laughs> just the internet way about it? That is just... That, that is board game media. <laughs> that is, that's, <laughs> that's what that is. It pretty much is. Here's Let the thing. I could never it. create this magical thing that takes dozens of people and hundreds of hours of work, and I hate it. <laughs> I don't like the color scheme. Yeah. It's crap. They could have done better. Two okay. out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> don't buy don't buy this thing that this person spent 120 hours of their life mortgaged some other house for and sold their dog so they could get it to the table funded really it <laughs> kind the of hubris thing. the absolute hubris of the people we are yeah we're a disgrace i, I agree <laughs> we must be stopped at some point but not just not until i say i'm finished then you can stop everything else um if people if I mean, I mean, I'm disappointed you haven't sworn yet. If people, um, <laughs> if people want to find you on the internet webs, where do why you on earth would anybody want to do that? Where do you want? Don't I? Do I have no idea because um, you know. Um, but if they did, if they've listened along, mm-hmm. and they've went, I want to know more. <laughs> this sounds people. interesting. <laughs> How do we find this person? Where do you exist on the internet webs? I exist. uh, (laughs) Oh, you poor people. So you can find me most active on Twitter. My handle there is at 425Suzanne. Don't ask where the other 424 Suzannes went to. There's a story behind it. Okay. And... (laughs) uh, You can find me on Board Game Geek, the ubiquitous Board Game Geek site. My Mm -hmm. handle there is Gibbous. G-I-B-B-O-U-S. Do with that as you will. Keep in mind, you can't change your... I've been on Board Game Geek for over a decade, and you can't change your username there once you establish no. it, so... No, you can't. Choice, choices were made. Um, <laughs> Regrets have been had. Yeah. You can always email me at 425Suzanne at Gmail, and oh. you can listen to my podcast. I host half of the dice tower podcast episodes with my podcasting part partner mandy and you can find our new shows aptastic and the upcoming sultan sass on the dice towers youtube channel and what we will do is we will put all of these links in the show notes so that we have got notes to show um if you want to keep an eye on what we're up to just go to the internet webs and search for we're not wizards um if you want to read about stuff we do, we've got a blog. It's we're not wizards.blogspot.com. We've got Twitter and we've got Instagram. We've got Facebook. You just search for We're Not Wizards, you'll find us because we're spreading everywhere. Um, you know, just like things that spread, like jam. Um, if you like or what you listen to, it depends because it was crunchy and the bread's like. Oh, good point. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I think I'm hungry now. Yeah, a Reese's, a Reese's Pieces dog would just go down the street just now. <laughs> um, but if you like what you've listened to tonight, then um, there's a couple of things you can do. You can go to our Patreon and support us on an ongoing basis because that helps pay for um, things that I want to buy. Let's be honest. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can jump onto the podcast catchers of choice and drop a subscription. If you like us even more, go to the Apple Podcasts and drop us a rating or a review. If you are going to be dropping us a rating or a review, do not give us 10 stars because it makes us big-headed. But don't give us one because it makes us cry. Give us something in the middle, like a five, because it's average. Then yeah, we're just a little bit average. But the person who's not been average tonight is a rather wonderful, rather fantastic Suzanne Sheldon. Thank Huzzah. you very, very much. Thank you very, very much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me on. I uh, I am so glad to have finally made it happen. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> There's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Suzanne?
We are not wizards. Yay. That's good. I'm glad because you could have let me down at the end. And that would have been disappointing. Um, and the other thing is to say goodbye. So it's a uh, goodbye from Suzanne. Say goodbye, Suzanne. Goodbye, Suzanne. And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe, roll sixes, make something awful. Until the next time, get yourself a little bit of salt and sass about you <laughs> with your little kind of game that people are saying shouldn't be an 18xx game, but everybody <laughs> says who is. Um, come fight me. Until the next time, though, goodbye. Goodbye. A wizard is never late. Is he early? He arrives precisely when he means to.